All right, good morning. I want to thank you for joining me. Um, today we're going to continue the study in Romans. It's Romans chapter 2, we're going to begin at verse 17. I've titled this message, Be Followers of Christ. So I thank you for joining me, those that love the Word of God. I, I'm a lover of the Word of God myself. It's the power of God that works within us to change us, to give us joy, peace, all the fruit of the Spirit. And God uses his word to do that also. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the book of Romans, and we will begin at uh, verse 17. So Heavenly Father, I do pray and ask that you bless this message. I pray that you bless the reading of your word. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, he says, I beseech you, brethren. In other words, I'm begging you, be ye followers of me. He reiterates this, or says it again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. And he, he adds to it, or expounds upon it a little bit. He says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So, what was happening here in the early churches were people, just like today, were rising up, claiming to be teachers. And everybody wanted to be a teacher. And, and well, not everybody, that's an exaggeration, but... But many times people want to be teachers that are not called of God. They feel like they should be a teacher, but in essence, if you're not called of God, you're not equipped of God. God equips those whom he calls. And, you know, this is a hot spot in many of the churches today. Um, I'd say the number one thing I, I meet with people looking for churches is they cannot find a church where the word of God is being taught. I, I have just recently been working with an individual that's been in the church 40 years and is completely ignorant of the Bible. Can't even find a Bible book, didn't even have a Bible. And the individual had been in the church 40, 50 years, well, more than that since birth, so in their 70s. But they were never told they needed a Bible, they were never told they needed to read the Bible. And they're not getting messages. They're getting, they're getting messages, but they're not messages from God. They're, they're messages that make you feel good, that make you more devoted to the church. But oftentimes they contradict the word of God. Here's the problem that was happening in the Roman church and what Paul's confronting. Is you'll get people that, that they may have good intentions. Most of the times they do. But they're deceived. The greatest deception is self-deception. And the Bible says, Be ye not deceived. What? Know ye not the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? It's talking about self-deception. We call this in psychology denial. And what happens is when somebody goes into denial, they're, they're unable to see the truth, even when it's right in front of them. They will justify it. They will make excuses for it. And that's what happens, unfortunately. So let's begin in verse 17, and, and you'll see what I'm talking about. He says, Behold, or in other words, stand and awe, take note. He's trying to get their attention. Thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God. So let's stop here, because I've had people say, Well, I'm not a Jew. You know, I, I'm, I'm a Gentile, and this is only for the Jews. Well, actually, it's not. What he's saying here is behold, and he's emphasizing the importance of stop what you're doing and listen to the truth. See the truth. Open the eyes of your mind and heart. That's what he's saying here in these first five words in the Greek. And he's telling them that they are blinded to their own true estate. You see, many people are in bondage and they can't see the truth when it's right in front of them. So they're, they've been ensnared by the devil working with their flesh, and it's blinded them to the estate of their own sin. He says, thou art called a Jew. This means you have been named a Jew. It doesn't mean you call yourself a Jew. It means you've been named a Jew by God. And the word Jew means he shall be praised. When you become a child of God, you are named a Jew. You've been grafted into the tree by God's own hand, and you're now a child of his. And that name Jew means you will be praising God. God shall be praised by you. So, that brings us to another point here, which I'm just going to interject briefly. 
is the power of God is in the praise of his people. Too often people get into these negative modes where all they want to do is criticize God or criticize others or criticize their circumstance, their place, you know, their life. But the power of God is in the praise of his people. And it means when you thank him, you praise him, and you truly mean it. It's not a false meaning. Contentedness, gratitude, those are parts of the Christian life. The Holy Spirit equips us with that. So, he's saying, take note, look at the truth. You are called a child of the praise of God. And he says, and, and this is the word kaya, it means indeed you rest in the law. That means you've made this the place of your mind. You're settled on the law. They call them nominiums. Nominiums, or nominius in the Greek, nominiums are those who, what they call them in English is legalists. They're always saying, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. You know what's interesting is they'll have a list of, an uh, endless list of things you can't do. But they never tell you what you should be doing right. Or they will be telling you what you should be doing right, but not how to truly live in Christ. My motto, and I got it from a lady by the name of Bobby Reed way back in 1989. She said, life is not to be endured, life is to be enjoyed. And when you're in Jesus Christ, every day is a good day. So he says, indeed, you're resting on the law. You've made that your solid ground rather than Christ. He says, and Kaya, and indeed you make your boast. That means you glory in how you are a child of God. And, and literally he's saying you spout it out and you're proud of it. You tell everybody how you're a child of God and what you do and don't do and what they should and shouldn't do. He says, and indeed, and it, it, the word and means indeed. It means he's being very forceful. It have an exclamation point after it. He says, and indeed you know and this is the word ginosko, means you have learned. doesn't mean you practice. Epigenosko is when you're, you're practicing it in your life with Christ. It means it's a part of your life. But when somebody's ginosko, that means they've studied it, they're not living it. And you see, that's the problem with many of these teachers, especially televangelists and, and these large worship center leaders. They'll teach about one thing, but they've not they don't have the ability to live it. And they'll act like they do. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Some of the greatest leaders of our country in Christianity, I won't say any names, had the worst family problems. Sending their daughters off to give birth, adopting the babies out, putting their kids into rehab, not letting anybody know because they had to keep that lifestyle. He says, indeed, you know. This means you've learned what the will of God is. You know what it is that will please God. And indeed, you approve. And this means you test and scrutinize what is good or evil. That means they are very good at determining what's good or what's evil. Being instructed, and this means passed down to you through the teaching by word of mouth. It's called the oral interpretation. When somebody has you memorize it and learn it. You've been taught this by word of mouth out of the law, nomos, meaning Nomos is the word that they use for law. But what's interesting is nomos also means food that's given to animals, how you feed animals. It's the food they graze on. It's that which they get their life from. And so out of the law literally means that which we are to be learning from, growing on, feeding from. It's the nomos. And it's the rule of life that pleases and is approved by God. So Friends, he's writing to a group of people that are very committed. The most dangerous person you can ever meet is somebody who's religiously committed in error. This is why jihadists, Islam, Islam is a, is a deceitful religion. They sodomize their daughters, the men abuse the women, they sell them like slaves, it's satanic. And they are very committed to killing anyone that is a Christian, Jew, or non-Islamic. Islam overcomes and conquers by two ways. It's right from the Quran. They are told if you cannot organize a militia or military and go in and conquer and slay them all, like the church in Ephesus in Turkey, 
the blood was so deep that running down the streets that they took their hats off their head and dipped it. And that's where you get the Red Shriners hat. And then they spun their head. And that's where the Fez was, is they would scatter the blood of the Christians. They slit their throats and smashed the babies' heads on the sides of the buildings and rocks. That's where your Shriners come from. And that's why they have the Islamic sword with the Eastern Star, which, by the way, is the Star of Ashtaroth. It's very occultic, very satanic. The second way that they do it, if they can't come in and kill you and just take over your land and convert you, is they go in through settling. They are commanded to go in in mass numbers, settle in an area, have as many children as possible, and in one generation take over by overpopulating. That's what's happened in the state of Michigan, it's happening in New York, it's happening all across this country. We have been under a jihad attack for decades and people just don't know it. They bombed 9-11 and here people have forgotten about it. Religious zealots are the most dangerous people in the world. And a Christian is not to be like that. A Christian is not to be somebody that, that rips others apart or chews on them like a dog. As a Christian, we're to be emanating Christ. And Paul's about to get to that. That's why in Corinthians he says, Be a follower. It's the word mimicry. It means an imitator of me, even as I am of Christ. He says to him in verse 19, You are confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind and a light of them in darkness. These people were convinced that they were not only the children of God living a devoted life, but that they were the ones that should be leading that other generation. But what's interesting is it, is it says here they were deceived. And we get into this word and, when it says and are confident, it's not the word indeed or kaya, it's the word te, which is a totally different word in the Greek. And te means not only everything that I've just mentioned, but it means you are confident in it. That means they were very persuaded of their position and they sought to persuade others of their position. So they were confident that they were the leaders and guides to those who were blind to the truth. And what's interesting is the emphasis when you get to it in the Greek, it means they felt like their job in existence, the, the job they were given by Christ was to be leaders and teachers of those that were mentally blind and ignorant. And they were going to show them as a light how to get out of the darkness. Verse 20, he says, You're also, you know, Taya, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth of the law. So this yeah, word instructor of the foolish is padudes, and it means you're a trainer of children, of those who are foolish, senseless, and stupid, without reflection of intelligence. This is what they felt like, that these people were completely ignorant. It was their job to lead them and guide them. People are always looking for a leader and a guide in their life. But you know what? Jesus Christ is our leader. He is our guide. And a true teacher of Jesus Christ emanates and follows Christ. So what's interesting is we get down here. And they had a form, he says, which means a semblance. It means they knew about, but they were not able to emanate and practice. And the word truth here is aletheia and that's what the word truth means it means they really they had an idea of what the truth was they they've studied it but they weren't practicing practicing it and that is a number problem in many people's lives friend you're going to learn a secret here he says thou therefore that teachest another teachest thou not thyself thou that preachest a man should not steal. Does thou steal? See, these are rhetorical questions, and he's going to begin with a barrage of them. And here's what it simply comes down to. None of us are free of sin. None of us can live the law. Not a single person alive can keep the law. Many people are deluded. They think they keep the law. I heard a Methodist preacher, she was female, and her husband, both preachers, and... I used to have to attend these services by all these different faiths. It was the requirement the first church I was at. I had to be on this board. And the lady was so bold as to say, I haven't sinned in 19 years. And I thought to myself, you're sinning right now, you liar. 
And her husband said, me in 18 years since she converted me. She's the greatest preacher in our house. And I thought, well, the Bible's very clear that a woman cannot be a pastor. So you're in sin right now following her and claiming that she is one and she's in one also. We all sin. We are all separated by sin. But Jesus has washed away our sins and joined us to God. Our flesh will sin against him. So when he's saying, thou that teachest another should not steal, does thou steal? You that teach others, don't you teach yourself? He's trying to show them that you can't keep the law. They may think they are because they're in a state of denial. You may not steal a car, but how often do you steal glory from God? How, you know, by not glorifying him the way you should. Nobody can do that. We're not perfect. We can do it in bits and pieces. How about time? Do you go out and serve the Lord? Jehovah Witnesses will do it and they'll watch their watch because they think they have to give an hour a week. When that hour is done, they pack up and leave. You know, it's all about that hour. Do you steal in tithes? Do you not give your tithe unto the church? People steal from God all the time. They just don't realize it. He says, Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, does thou committest adultery? Thou abhorrest idols, does thou commit sacrilege? And in other words, do you know if you look on a woman to lust, or if a woman looks on a man to lust, you've committed adultery. But adultery goes even farther than sexual adultery. It talks about the gods of this world, and that's why he says, Thou that abhorrest idols, you hate people that are pagan or devil worshippers or worshipping things of this world, but you also commit sacrilege. And sacrilege means this. It, it literally means you rob temples that you hate, in order to plunder their shrines. So somebody may say that, you know, they hate such and such an act or, or they're not into doing such and such a thing, but actually they will profit from it. I mean, you know, so many entertainers in Hollywood are, are worshipped by people and they don't even realize they're worshipping. They idolize them. They give the place that should belong to God unto them. So it's spiritual adultery as well as physical adultery. He says, Thou that makest thy boast of the law, verse 23, thou breakest the law. Through breaking the law you dishonorest thou God. It's a statement. In other words, people brag about their Christianity. They try to teach others how to be a better Christian. But in real life, we all break the law. That's why the Bible says, since we sin, in 1 John chapter 1, verses 7, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, he says, but, and that was a verse from Romans, he says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here's what it all comes down to. We can't keep the law. Jesus kept it for us. We should try to live a holy life. We should try to live a devoted life. But you cannot do it by simply knowing the facts. The only way it can be done is when you surrender yourself to Jesus Christ and allow him to work through you. In Romans he says, Whomsoever you yield yourself up to, the world, the flesh, the devil, or the spirit, to that one you will be their servant. So we have to surrender ourselves to God. And I'm going to tell you something. The wisdom of God is, first of all, peaceable. When somebody tells me that God has led them in a certain way, but they're angry, I'll look at them and say, you're not getting that from God because the Spirit of God doesn't cause you to be angry. He gives you peace when it comes upon you. Look at verse 24. The name of God is blasphemed amongst the Gentiles through you. As it is written. Do you realize when people act holier than thou amongst the unsaved, but the unsaved can see the truth because they're not in denial. You make the, the name of God stink. Many parents do this with their children. They will talk and act holier than thou at church. But what they don't do is admit that on the way to church they were yelling at their kids or their wives acting in very ungodly ways. Or at home they'll watch things on TV. This is robbing the temple, saying you don't worship or idolize something, but yet you'll watch it on the screen. I can't tell you, but the entire you know, Hallmark movie channel is based 
on romance. And when you see other people, you know, the Bible's very plain, getting very romantic and stuff like that on the screen, you're becoming a partaker of it. The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles. That means those that have not come to salvation. Blaspheme means you cause it to stink. And it means they will speak reproachably or rail against it. This is why so many people don't want anything to do with the church, because they've seen how people in the church will act. He says in verse 25, Circumcision verily profit if you keep the law. But if you're a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? You notice the righteousness of the law is said. Not keeping the law, but the righteousness of the law. And this is where it talks about the Spirit. Righteousness of the law means this. It means your intentions are to do good. You realize you can't, and so you're dependent and you place it in God's hands. You make the mistake, you recognize it, you apologize, you try to do right, and you allow God to flow through you. That's how you keep the righteousness of the law. Verse 27, Shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? In other words, the one who has the love of God and follows in Christ's steps will be judging those that claim they're keeping the law, but aren't. It's the old adage that was said earlier in, in Luke, Physician, heal thyself. In other words, you have the same problem. You've got a moat in your eye or a weaver's beam and you're trying to get a speck of, of sawdust out of somebody else's eye. He is a Jew, for he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, Neither is that circumcision, which is the outward of the flesh. But he is a Jew, a person that will be praising God, which is one inwardly. And see here, this is from Jeremiah, where the heart would be circumcised. He said the heart would be as hard as adamantium, or the hardest metal known. Heart is a rock, but God would circumcise the heart and make it as soft as flesh, tender to the touch. He is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and the circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter whose praise is not of men, but is of God. So here's where it's all summed up. Many people will try and boast about being a Christian, a child of God, because they're doing it for their own egos and the praise of men. But the true Christian is the one that does it from the heart, because they love God and they love others. And love is the number one thing that the Holy Spirit brings us. It's the ability to love God, to love others, more than ourselves. All right, this is Dr. Tom. I want to thank you for joining me. I want to just give God the praise for everything he does in our lives. I appreciate your prayers. And I just lift up the Lord in Christ's name. Father, I pray and ask that you bless this message. Pray this prayer. True Heavenly Father, help me to live my life for you. Not through legalism or a bunch of do's and don'ts, but rather let me surrender to your word. Give me grace to love you with my whole heart. Give me grace to love others more than myself. And Lord, let me set my eyes on things that will honor you, because my heart will follow. I pray this day that you would work through me to glorify your own name. In Christ Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. All right, Lord bless you, and I'll see you again as we get into Romans chapter 3.